messages and I came up with just one which is probably good so remember I was going to tell you about what's that hi how you been what's up what's up how's it going all right so um let's sit down because you know I'm exhausted okay so I'm going to tell you a little bit about Sometimes, what do these look like? What does this look like to you? What does it remind you of? 
the shades. It's supposed, it's supposed to remind it. Yeah, what'd you say? A star. So the pointy leaves remind us of the star of Bethlehem. That was the star. Remember the star of Bethlehem? Do you remember that story? No? No? That's all right. I don't care. So it's supposed to remember us of the star of Bethlehem, which led the wise men to Jesus, and the star of Bethlehem also. Who else saw the star of Bethlehem besides the wise men? Anybody remember the Christmas story? Does anybody remember the guys in the field? They were watching their a couple of years late. late. Yeah. And so what happened? They saw the stars and then a heavenly host of angels. Is anybody a heavenly host? Yeah. Come on with that. All right. Anyway, so that's, and then the red reminds us of the blood of Jesus because Jesus grew up from a baby in a manger, didn't he? Yep. Grew up, lived a life, showed us how to love people, died so that we can be with him in heaven. So that's what Christmas and the point set up have in common. Okay, you ready to pray? Yeah? Ready to pray? Yeah. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for um, all these symbols of Christmas. The Christmas tree is a symbol of the birth of Jesus. The poinsettia reminds us of the birth of Jesus. So we thank you that all these symbols can point symbolically and theologically to you. So we thank you for that. And may we remember what this season is all about. The baby born in a manger grew up and became a man, lived a life, died a death, so that we could be with them. So we thank you for that gift. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you. So do you want a gusher? Yes. Who wants a gusher? I do. Me? All right. Come here. You are the you are the What's that? Who wants a gusher? Who wants a gusher? Who wants a gusher? Wants a gusher? Can you have these? I don't know. I'm going to give you one. Probably in trouble. Oops. Sorry. Oops, sorry. Jeez, I'm getting kind of crazy. Who else wants one? Want one? I think. You want one? Can I get one? You can hold on. Does everybody get one? Everybody get one? Anybody else want one? Who wants one? Old kids? No? Old kids want one? Old kids. You're an old kid. You're still a kid in my eyes, right? There, he got it. Did you get one, Alyssa? Do you want one? Huh? Oh, you can't have one? Oh, yeah, that's right. You got braces. I don't have braces. Not that. We skipped that, didn't we? See how I am? Glad you came up here. Remind me. The microphone's right there. Those we hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Today we light the candle of hope. Israel had been beaten down by secession of world powers, Babylon, Persia, the Greeks, and now Rome. In their distress, they call out, Come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel. Yet in the cry, there is hope, a strong expectation that God will keep his promises to send a Messiah, a deliverer. The hope is fulfilled on the first Christmas day when Jesus is born in Bethlehem. God's Savior sent to planet Earth to save us from our sins and deliver us from whatever oppresses us. People live in hope of one who can help them. Jesus is that person, present today by the Holy Spirit to deliver us from any need. He is the one we hope for. Please join me in prayer. Father, thank you for sending Jesus into our world, our hope of glory, our blessed hope of resurrection and eternal life. In his name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Good job. Good job. All right.
right, our scripture reading is Luke 6, 46 through 49, the NIV version. The wise and foolish builders. Why do you call me, Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they are like. They are like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck that house, but could not shake it, because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and destruction was complete. This is the word of God for the people of God. I tell you, I was talking to my husband the other day. I'm like, why is this so difficult every Sunday? And Ben is texting me at 7 o'clock at night on Saturday. Colleen, you get the sermon yet? Colleen, you get the sermon yet? I got something. I've got something. So I want to ask you a couple questions. So play along. Okay, play along. All right. So would you agree that dealing with tantrums is part of raising a toddler? Jill, would you agree that um, dealing with tantrums is part of raising a toddler? Yes. <laughs> How many would agree with that? Yeah. yeah. So if you don't want to deal with tantrums, don't raise a toddler, right? Don't have a kid. How about being on call 24-7 is part of what it means to be in the vocation of pastor? Did you know I'm on call 24-7? I mean, I could choose not to be on call 24-7, but when someone is in a serious car accident at 2 in the morning, they call me and I don't go, probably won't be a pastor for very long, right? Right? So it's, it's part of the job. How about dealing with customer complaints in the retail job? Would you say that's part of what it means to be in the retail business or to even own a retail company? I mean, I could just sit here and, and ring the people up and they start complaining about something and say, mm, talk to the hand, I don't want to deal with you. I mean, am I going to have a job the next day? I don't know, maybe because people are so desperate and we've seen some retail workers, but try to be kind to retail workers. So dealing with customers is part of working in retail. Would you say death is part of life? Can you separate death from life? I know there's some people that think you can and they freeze bodies and then they hope when they can. Isn't that weird? Good Lord. No, I'd go see Jesus. Okay, would you say, this is funny, Julie's going to laugh because the other Julie, I have many Julies in my life, Julie, Julie, my sister Julie, I have a lot of Julies. I, <laughs> death, would you say death is part and partial of night, or death is part and partial of life? Do you know what part and parcel means? Does anybody know what part and parcel means? No? Who raised their, raise your hand if you know what it means. So some of you know what it means, right? It's essential, it's necessary, it's part of something to make it a whole. You, you can't have it without it, right? You can't have part of this without making this thing whole. So death is part and parcel of life. So I asked a couple of people on uh, Wednesday when I was trying to work on this sermon, no, Friday, and I said, does anybody know what part and parcel is? And <laughs> they're like, nope. And I asked one person, they said, is that part of the song? And I'm like, oh, crap, I'm not going to use it. <laughs> and so another lady said, just don't use it. It doesn't make any sense. I don't know why you're trying to use it. Because it's so cool, part and parcel. So, okay, whatever. <laughs> Would you say grief is part of loving? Yeah. Yes. Because death is part of life, isn't it? So grief is part of loving people. Can you separate those things? You can try not to love people, but it's not going to happen, right? Would you say darkness is part of night? It's what defines night? So would you agree that you can't separate death from light, right? You can't separate darkness from night. Can you separate mistakes from being human? No, they're going to happen, right? And you can't separate Jesus as Lord from his lordship. They go together. They're part and parcel. Mm -hmm. Jesus being Lord means he has lordship. If someone has lordship, that means they're a lord, right? They go together. So today we're going to have the fun job of talking about what it means to be obedient to the lordship of Christ. Okay, now everybody wants to leave, right? <laughs> when we call Jesus Lord, we don't separate his lordship. They go together. Just like... Darkness goes with night, like death goes with life, like mistakes goes with human beings, like raising a toddler means you're going to have to deal with tantrums. 
They go together. They go together. You can't separate them, although we try to do that, don't we? So we're going to talk about the nasty word submission. And we have blown it way, way out of proportion. So ladies, don't start whittling because we're going to talk about it. So anyway, so when we call Jesus our Lord, we submit to his lordship. It's part of what it means to be a disciple. It's part and parcel of being a disciple. It's an essential part of being a disciple. It's what it means when we call Jesus Lord. That means we do what he says, right? This is what he says in Luke 6. Let's look at it again. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, but don't do what I ask? So he's saying these things are connected, right? Why do you call me Lord, but then you choose to do not what I ask you to do? I command you to love one another and you refuse, right? We, when we submit to Jesus as Lordship, it's when we call him Lord. So when we sing this really cute hymn, the little Lord Jesus laid down his sweet head. And we have this picture of this beautiful little infant, beautiful little infant, Lord Jesus. They didn't say, the little baby Jesus laid down his sweet head. They said, the little Lord Jesus laid down his sweet head. So when we call Jesus Lord and we follow his Lordship, we are proving that Jesus is Lord. When we don't follow his lordship, we're just disobeying because Jesus is still Lord. So we're going to try to piece this together through our sermon series, Christmas Carols. I really don't know why the preacher put these two together. He picked this scripture, and I went, how in the world is this going to go together? But the more I was reading away in a major of the lyrics... It's a beat, it's a cradle hymn. It's a, you know, it's something you'd sing to your your little baby, you know, to get him to go to sleep. It's just a, one of those um, it's just a, one of those wonderful songs that you'd sing like a nursery rhyme, but it's not. It is theologically based. It is heavily theologically based. So that's what we're going to talk about as we continue through Christmas carols. That's our series and we're looking at the famous songs that should bring us to our knees at the manger. Not throw a manger under the tree and then go out and yell at your neighbor, okay? So a way in a manger, let me tell you a little bit about the history of a way in a manger. It's one of the most popular Christmas carols, I say because it only has three verses, that's why I think it's very popular. Um, but nobody knows who actually wrote it. Oh, there's speculation. Some give credit to a guy named James Murray, who was an 1887 American hymn writer, who entitled the tune, Luther's Cradle Hymn. Have you heard this? After Martin Luther? Okay, the great Reformation guy in Germany, one of reform, you know, Reformation is kind of built around Martin Luther and John Keller. Luther's Cradle Hymn. And the story that this guy made up was that Martin Luther wrote the lyrics and sang the song to his children. He never did. But because Martin Luther was so famous that it stuck. But here's the thing. The German mothers and the German grandmothers didn't even know the name of this song. They had no idea in that era when um, Martin Luther was around. They had no idea. So some his, hymn historians say that the song, at least the first two verses, because it was originally just two verses, was probably written in the mid-1800s by an anonymous American. Then a guy named Charles Hutchinson Gabriel, that's his name, he was a music director at a Grace Methodist Episcopal Church, a Methodist church. He published a new version of the hymn that included the third verse. So when you hear Luther's cradle hymn, you hear that story about Martin Luther writing this hymn and um, singing it to his children. It was just a made up, made up story. We don't know why the guy made it up, but that's who they think made it up. But it was probably written anonymously by someone. But the whole point of the song is still important. The song is all about the incredible humble birth of the greatest man who ever lived. But he's more than a man. He is the Lord of all creation. So I think in order to submit to Jesus' as lordship, we have to look at the word Lord and how Jesus in the Greek defined this, because that's what the New Testament is written in, is in Greek. So let's look at the Greek word for Lord. It's kurios, and this is what it means. Supreme in authority, controller, <laughs> and master. Okay. So whenever you say, the little Lord Jesus is supreme in authority. He's in control of your life. You call Jesus Lord? 
Have you made Jesus your Lord? If you've made Jesus your Lord, he is the supreme authority. He is your authority. He is the one that gets to tell you what to do. He is in control. He is your master. That's a word that nobody likes anymore. Apparently you can't even say master bedroom anymore. You can't. That's bad, I guess. But Jesus says, I'm master. I'm supreme in authority. I'm the one in control. So if someone has authority over you and they ask you to do something, you're probably going to do it. I'm going to use the military because they do what they're told to do, right? If, if a captain tells a sergeant, tell me if I've got the titles wrong, I probably do, or a private, go and do that, they have to go do it, right? Right? If the cop says, get out of the car and put your hands on the hood of the car, you're supposed to do it. Master gives orders and expects people to follow the orders. If this is what the Greek word for Lord means, then when we call Jesus our Lord, we submit to his authority and we do what he tells us to do, right? right. Yet we see authority, lack of it, lack of respect of authority, and there are some times when people don't deserve the authority. I get it. I know there's some police officers that aren't kind. I know there's some judges that aren't good, but... They're in the authoritative position, because if we didn't follow the rules, right, we'd have tyranny. So rules are good, okay? But not in religion, Colleen. Don't talk to me about rules. You know, we have a problem with authority. Nobody wants to be told what to do. You've seen that? Uh, it ruffles our feathers. We don't like to be told, you have to do this. You have to do it this way. You have to follow what this says. We, we don't. We resist it. It's, it's a, you know, we're self-governing, especially in the United States. Would you say that's how the world lives? I saw a guy, like I said before, just drive through a red light. The authority is red means stop, and he just decided he was just going to drive through it. You know, have you, have you seen this? Maybe you haven't, but I have not seen respect for authority in this world today. But if we've made Jesus our Lord, then his lordship is in authority over us. You can't separate the two. Just like you can't separate darkness from night, death from life, mistakes from being human. You can't separate the Lord from his lordship. So, if you've made Jesus your Lord, I'm assuming you have, I want you to know you have not made Jesus your Lord. Do you know why? Because Jesus has always been Lord. We don't make Jesus Lord. Jesus has always been the Lord of Lord and the King of Kings. We do not make Jesus Lord. Uh, you know my testimony. I've even said it, and it sounds really good. It is, when I was in third grade, I went to a Lutheran camp or a Baptist camp or somewhere, and they scared the Jesus into me, right? And I accepted Jesus in my heart, and I made Jesus Lord, and this is what I say. But I didn't start living for Jesus till I was in my 30s. And doesn't that sound nice? Because they say, be ready to share your testimony. It sounds so good, doesn't it? So basically, this is what I'm saying. First of all, Jesus is Lord, so I didn't make him Lord. The Spirit led me to that church, and that weird girl led me to that prayer, and then she sang, you are my sunshine, and it was weird. But Jesus has always been Lord. So when I say, I chose not to live for Jesus for 20 years, it just means I chose to disobey Jesus' lordship for 20 years. You get it? Because Jesus is Lord. He always has been Lord. He always will be Lord. And his lordship and him being Lord go together. Like death and life. Like darkness and night. Get it? Does that make sense? Part and parcel. Because <laughs> I said I wanted to use that word. <laughs> I know. I don't know why I keep wanting to use that word. <laughs> so when we say, away in a manger, no crib for a bed, the little Lord Jesus lay down his sweet head, even in the manger as an infant, Jesus is Lord. Would you agree? Even in a feeding trough, Jesus is Lord. Would you agree? The helpless infant is Lord of all creation. Would you agree? The Lord in the manger is the Lord of the cross, the Lord of the empty tomb, the Lord of the resurrection, and guess what? The Lord that will return again and judge the earth. Would you agree? So his lordship doesn't go away after he heads up to the right hand of the Father. And yet, and yet, Jesus.
Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? Do you hear him speaking to you? I hear him speaking to me but because, boy, can I get mad and say stupid stuff. And that's just disobedience. I haven't submitted to the authority of Christ. And you say, but when I become a believer of Jesus, his lordship goes with it. Yeah, it does. I don't take his lordship away. I'm just being disobedient. He's still lord. He's still in charge. He's still controller. He's still master. He's still a supreme authority. But when he asks me to do something hard, I don't want to do it. Right? But he's still Lord. He's still Lord. You're like, good Lord, this is a horrible thing to talk about for Christmas. I know. Too bad. So, how do we submit to the Lordship of Christ? Okay? Because we have to learn to do that. Because if we don't, who's going to make Jesus Lord? Who's going who's gonna to show the world that Jesus is Lord if we don't do what he says? Okay, so the first way we do this, Jesus is pretty clear. He tells us, everyone who comes to me by faith, which is a free gift, everyone who comes to me by faith, that's a free gift, okay? And here's my words, here's my words, here's my words, here's my words, and puts them into practice. Thou shalt not be a jerk in line at Best Buy. It says it right there in Isaiah. It doesn't say it in Isaiah. But, and puts them into practice, I will show you what they're like. So Jesus is pretty clear. He's pretty clear how we submit to his lordship. We've come to him by faith. He's always been the Lord. He's our supreme authority. He's the one in control of our lives and should be in control of our mouths and our tongues. He's the master, right? I said it, master. I'm sure I'll get somebody to say, you shouldn't say that. Too bad. He's master. That's right. So we are the people that listen to what he says if we have accepted Christ. So the obedient disciple is one who believes in Jesus by faith, calls him Lord, listens to his word, and puts his word into practice. So the first way we submit to Jesus' lordship is understanding that when Jesus says, when you call me Lord, Lord... Why don't you do what I say? When he says, when he says this, it isn't a threat. You know, because I've heard this preached with, Lord, why do you call me Lord? Why do you sit here and praise me at church? And why on Monday morning you're a jerk or you're yelling at your spouse or you think you're always right or, you know, and, and maybe that could be. But I think Jesus is saying, why do you call me Lord and you bring your offerings and you come to church and, and you worship me and then you don't do what I say? It should be, if you're going to call me Lord, you should do what I say because I'm the Lord. I know what's best for you. I know what you need before you even ask for it. So why wouldn't you do what I say? I think that's what he's trying to tell us. But we turn it into a threat, not an invitation. Jesus came to give us abundant life. That's what he said. This is the passageway to abundant life is obedience to Christ. Submission to the authority in our lives, Jesus. Submission to authority in our lives. That, that's what it means to have an abundant life. So if you're going to call me Lord, my Lordship goes with me. So why wouldn't you do what I say? I'm the one who knows everything. I'm all-knowing. I was around before I was in the manger. I was around calling light and calling the world into existence. I was there when I knit you together in your mother's womb. I know you. I know every hair on your head. So when you call me Lord, I love you, Jesus. And then I say it's best for you if you love your neighbor. Because your neighbor is hurting and in pain. But it's easier for us to just move. Right? Or put up a fence. I know what that neighbor needs. And the neighbor needs you. Because when you call me Lord and you obey me, then it looks like I'm really Lord, even though I am Lord, but to the world, it looks like you really do believe that I'm in charge of your life. And then the neighbor will see it. And then maybe the neighbor will go to church. And then maybe the neighbor will listen to the word. And maybe the neighbor will put it into practice. Lord and Lordship go together. We cannot separate that. We can never separate that. So the first way we 
submit to Jesus' lordship is we understand that it's an invitation to do what he says. The second way we submit to Jesus' lordship is to start digging. I was going to bring a shovel and I forgot it. Start digging. Jesus uses a parable to depict what it looks like to live a life in submission to Jesus' lordship. It takes work. It's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid a foundation upon the rock. I got a geologist here. How far does it take to get to the bedrock probably in Jesus' day? It's not going to just be a little, oh, there's the rock, is it? No, probably not. They're going to be digging for a long time to get to the bedrock, right? To the actual rock that doesn't move, whatever you call that layer of tectonic tape. tape. What are they? <laughs> tectonic plates, is that what they are? Close enough. Yeah. Close enough. <laughs> it's like, move on, Kelly. <laughs> so... We've heard this preach that the house represents our lives, right? It's all about the house. How is your house built? It's all about the house. The guy who didn't build it in the foundation, but it's, it's all about the foundation. It's not about the house. The houses look exactly the same. Or so you think. Unless you're a builder like my husband. Then they don't look the same if you're building on sand and you're building on bedrock, right? So I'll give you an example. We were looking at a house one time when houses were a little bit cheaper. And... Um, I said, I said, oh, hey, there's this really cool house by the, on the lake. It's got a beautiful view. And they redid the kitchen and the bathrooms. And um, it looks really good. And he said, he drove by and he goes, that foundation's no good. And I said, how do you know this? He says, because the house is crooked. <laughs> Once I knew the foundation was no good, I wasn't buying that house. But ask any realtor, what sells houses? It's not the foundation. It's the kitchen. Right? It's the bathrooms. It's the giant movie theater. It's the location, location, location. Foundations are not glamorous. Foundations you don't see. But if your foundation is not built on solid bedrock, when the storms come, we're in trouble. So the foundation that Jesus is talking about is the obedience to Christ. The submission to his lordship is the foundation that we build the house on, that we build our lives around. That's why this parable is so easy to get past and to think, well, the people who called him Lord really weren't believers. I don't know. I think they were. I think they were just being disobedient. And there's theological um, debates on it still. But I think they were just being disobedient. A solid foundation, would you agree, is essential for a sound building? Yeah? And when you build a house, do you put the foundation here and then put the house over here? Where do you put the house? On the foundation. I know this sounds elementary, but darkness and night, life and death, lordship and lord. Foundation, obedience, house, Christian life. <coughs> That's how we have to build our lives. That's what Christmas is teaching us today. That is what Jesus is teaching us today. I didn't stay a baby. And you know, I wasn't a baby to begin with. I have been and always will be the Lord, the one who you gave your heart to. And I said, do this. Because you know why? That's best for you. That's best for your life. <coughs> We all say, God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. So when he says forgive someone and you refuse to do it, we're just being disobedient. We're trying to separate his being Lord from his lordship. And a lot of people give up. Do you know why? They don't want to follow Jesus' lordship because digging down to bedrock takes sweat. It takes study. It takes time. It takes mistakes. You know, I, I don't know how many people have told me, I want to know more about the Bible. I'm not smart about the Bible. Do you love Jesus? Yeah. Then do what he says. Let's start there. Right? I mean, you can read everything. I mean, I was talking to somebody and I said, you know, I don't like my responses lately. They've been really short. And if it was Larry was here, what would he say, Jenna? Getting snarky, Pastor. Right? That's what he would always say. Getting snarky. And I didn't like my responses to... No, I mean, why are people why are people irritating me? They shouldn't be irritating me, right? And yet you say people are irritating. 
But we're believers in Jesus, and we have the foundation of following what Jesus says. Jesus was interrupted more than anybody I know that was going about living his life, trying to teach these disciples who are going to carry on, and he's probably thinking, oh, my Lord, what is going on? And he's interrupted all the time. Oh, can you touch my hand? Oh, can you touch my leg? Or I got a headache, or I got a crippled hand, or I got on and on and on. It went. He was exhausted. And not once did he say, you're annoying, unless it was to the Pharisees. But you know that person that comes to you for the 15th time, you're like, oh, Lord, I want to turn them off. Click, huh? What were you saying? Or guys, you saying something like <laughs> what? So, <laughs> so we want to know all this stuff about the Bible. We want it all to sink into our head. And I want to be able to say, yeah, I'm so smart that, you know, in Nehemiah and chapter 5, I know exactly what that's all about. I have no idea what this is about, but it looks horrible. <laughs> but I can tell you what I do know is that I know Jesus is Lord, and every time I don't submit to his authority, I'm not not a believer. I'm just being disobedient. But I should feel the weight of that. I should understand that that's an invitation for me to have an abundant life. So every time I choose not to obey Jesus, my life might not go so good. Do you know some people whose life's not going so good? And I'm not saying that when we obey Jesus, everything's going to be great because we know a lot of very, very devout Christians whose health is bad. Right? So, the third way. The third way we submit to Jesus' lordship is understanding that obedience protects us from torrential floods of life. When a flood came... The torrent struck that house, but could not shake it because it was well built. There will be floods of trials in our life, disappointments, setbacks, loss of a job, loss of health as we age, even betrayal by people that we love. There will be floods of temptation to buy things we can't afford, especially during Christmas, right? <laughs> to sin in our anger and then justify it. Do you know that's a double whammy? That's a double sin. When you're angry with someone and you sin and say something, and then you justify why you yelled at them. <laughs> That's a double way. Anybody ever do that? Maybe it's just, maybe just me. And being others, and the list goes on and on and on. Floods of trials and temptations are part of life. You cannot separate them. Just like you cannot separate death from life and darkness from night, and Jesus as Lord from Lordship. He says, this is why I tell you to build on the foundation of doing what I say, because I know the floods are coming. I know it's going to be difficult. I've lived a life for 33 years. I know what it means to want people, that people want to kill me. Literally, they wanted to kill Jesus. His own family would talk about betrayal. That cousin so mean to me. They wanted to throw him off a cliff. They said he was crazy. They said he was nuts. And they were plotting against him. And you got to remember, that'd be like the government in power and the FBI plotting to kill one of you guys. They have the power and authority to do it, don't they? And there's nothing you can do to stop it. That's what was going on. That was what was going on in Jesus' day. The, the religious people had power. They weren't like a local pastor in the middle of a small church. They had power. They could, I mean, they go up to talk to Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate, who had huge authority, was like a step down from the big guy, the Roman authority. And here's the chief priest going up and talking to him saying, you know, we can't kill him, but you can. And he is going to cause a scene. And you're going to be in trouble, Pontius Pilate. And you know that emperor is going to, going to come get you if you don't get things under control. You see how that all happened? And Jesus says, but I'm still Lord. I'm still Lord. They can disobey, but guess what? My lordship still rules, and I'm still in charge, and I'm still the authority, because I'm the one who's going to save you from sin and death. They don't know it yet, but they're included in it. Right? Because I got a plan. And I'm carrying it out. And all he asks us to do is to
do not separate his lordship from him being lord. Love your neighbor as yourself. I don't see a lot of it going on. Control your mouth. I don't see a lot of it going on. Quit gossiping about me and come tell me what's wrong. I bet you we can fix it. I, I'm just saying. You know, if there's a problem, come come talk to the person. And if you can, if you can't stand the person because they won't listen to you, bring somebody with you. This is this is what he says to do. When you call me Lord, my lordship goes with me. Why wouldn't you do what I say? Why wouldn't you listen? Why wouldn't you follow through my words? When you look at a woman in lust, I know where that's going to lead. Don't do it. <coughs> you know the whole adultery thing? Don't commit adultery. And he says, don't even look at a woman in lust. Because he knows where it's going to, he, he knows the temptation, the flood of temptation that's coming your way. And he knows it's going to ruin your life. And he knows it's going to ruin your marriage. And he knows you're going to end up having to deal with some other person that marries your spouse and raises your children. And yet I know people that are so angry about their spouse because they don't like them right now. That they're ready to just chuck it out the window. You know what I'm saying? And these are Christians who call Jesus Lord. And yet this is his lordship. This is what he says. We try to separate it. You can't. And if we don't build on the bedrock, if we don't build on the obedience and following what Jesus says, our lives will fall apart. I have seen a lot of lives falling apart. Follow what he says. Read everything you can on what the red letters mean. And they're hard sometimes. They're tough sometimes. And ladies, I told you I was going to talk about submission. You know who we submit to? And you can argue with me all day long if you want. It's Jesus Christ. Because back in Paul's day, we were about as worthless as goats. We were property. Is that what we are now? No. Heck, there's over half of us in the, in the world. Submission to Jesus Christ is who we submit to. Because when husband and wife submit to the authority of Christ and they get closer to Christ and they do it, they get closer to each other. That's who we submit to. That's who's in charge of our single women's homes. Because there's single women out there. Right? Husband and wife should submit to Jesus Christ together. Together. So enough of this 1918 B.C. baloney. And yeah, I'll probably get a lot of people talking to me about it. But you know what? All I do is I see women running the churches. <laughs> I mean, I do. They're the ones getting work done. <laughs> so are my men here. But you know what I mean? I see a lot of women working. I see them bringing home the bacon. <laughs> I see them volunteering. I see them doing a lot of stuff. I mean, and, and you can look at it differently if you want, and that's okay. Um, but in my opinion, if we all submitted to Jesus and to his authority, we'd have a lot better, um, we'd have a lower percentage of divorce. I think that's what causes a lot of divorce. I personally do. I think if we build our lives based on the authority of Christ and what he says, Jesus is Lord and his Lordship are connected, like the house is connected to the foundation. So when we sing, be near me, Lord Jesus, I ask you to stay close by me forever and love me, I pray. Foundation is very close to a house, isn't it? So what it's sitting on, Jesus as Lord and his Lordship are very close to us. The baby in a manger that we sing about and ask to be with us forever and ever brings his power, but he brings his authority. He brings his supreme authority over our lives. 
When we sing this song, we're praying to Jesus, the Lord of all creation, to teach us how to be submissive to his lordship, the very foundation of our faith and the protection for our lives. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. And we thank you for reminding us that the song it sounds like a nursery rhyme, but really there's tons of theology in it. Little Lord Jesus, you are the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. And we have to remember that, that your Lordship goes with your you as Lord. They're together, one. We can't separate it. And why would we want to? Why wouldn't we want to do what you say? That's how we live an abundant life. So help us today to do it so that we can prove to the world that the baby in the manger is the Lord of all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So that is away in a manger. So I don't know what the next one is. So we are going to do communion. Right? You're going to help me. Out. All right. So come on up here. So... won't go on any more theological rampages, but <laughs> the reason that we have an open communion table in the Methodist church is because Jesus fed all of his disciples. He said, come, take this, eat this, do what I say, remember what I have done for you. It's a command. I'm sorry, but nobody can tell me not to follow what Jesus says. It's a command. And I'm going to follow Jesus and his words before I'm going to follow somebody else. So, right? So, on the night that Jesus gave up his life for you and for me, <coughs> we should probably put this on. He took hand sanitizer. <laughs> <laughs> Did not. Now, we do have some um, portable communion elements, so those are gluten-free, so you can take them if you have a gluten um, allergy. But also, uh, I've got some people helping me, and they're going to be taking out the elements. They only last for a week. That's what the bishop tells us. So the consecration part, when you ask God to consecrate them, you know, ask him to bless them. So they have a week to take them out to some shut-in. So um, they're going to go and do that. So isn't that cool? So that's why they're up here. I have to consecrate them. So on the night that Jesus gave up his life for you and me, he took bread. He lifted it up to heaven and he gave thanks to God for it. And then he took it and he broke it. And he said to his disciples, take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then after the supper, he took the cup. And lifting it up to heaven, he gave thanks to God for it. And he said, take, drink. This is my blood of the new covenant. Shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this, all of you, and remember what I've done for you. Let us pray. Lord, we do thank you that you are our Lord, that you do have authority over us. You have authority of e for over each person in this room. We thank you for the gift of faith. We thank you for teaching us every day to be obedient to your Lordship. We thank you for this bread and this juice, Lord, and may each person who receive it, may they receive something they need in that moment. And may this bread and this juice be the very body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
come when you're ready.
it's time for prayers. So what do we want to lift up to God today? And remember to write your prayers down and you can and we'll get them to our prayer chain. So what do we have to pray about? That good of a week, eh? <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Jamie. Um, I they finally built it? That's the one that burnt down a Cadillac? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because I know they were in a tent. So. They're building it. It's not done yet. They're okay. building them. Good. Perfect. All right. Um, we want to pray for um, the woman that was injured in the hit and run. So we want to pray for her. I don't know her name. Yes. Jerry's on her way to Detroit? Okay. Okay. Got Just, you got rid of her. <laughs> Safe travels for Jerry. Yeah. The girl's name is Allie Baker, and she's actually a distant cousin of mine. So oh, I'm sorry. I don't have really heard much of how she's doing. So okay. So Allie Baker. Allie Baker, was yeah. The one that was injured. Okay. And then I guess I'll also say thank you to everybody for praying for Leo. Uh, it was a long week in the hospital. But he's, he's, he's back and he's doing good. Yay, Leo. It's so good to have him back. Woo. All right. Stacy. Um, answers prayers for my grandfather's health. He's better, and they have a plan set for improving him more. Okay. So um, what's his first name? Dar. Dar? Yeah. D-A-R. Okay. Glad he's doing better. Bob. Michelle and Jordan and his family. Okay. Michelle for personal, and Jordan and his family for personal. Bill? Uh, my brother-in-law, Phil Cotter, for surgery. Phil for surgery. Okay. Shelly? I have a cousin who's named. So for Jesse, who's in the hospital, he's got a lot of kids, and he's the one making some bread out there, and now he's laid up. So for healing for him. Okay. Other prayers? Yeah. Uh, the joy of the cat scan for the lung cancer, they didn't find it. Yay! So that's a joy. Wonderful. Thank you. Other prayers? Connie? Um, Carol Inman. Carol Inman, yep, for healing, yep. And uh, uh, our daughter, Tina, personal. Okay. Uh, Barry Nickerson. Okay, thank you. Yeah. There's for Terry Rothwell for help. Terry Rothwell for help. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Jenna. Uh, Larry got a good report on his CT scan. Yes. Okay, so that's good news. Okay, so for Larry, that is good news. That's a joy. Scott. Uh, we have a friend who's been dealing with cancer for a few years. Her name's Brenda. And, Brenda. Uh, Okay, so for Brenda for cancer. More okay, that they can do something with those. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay. Um, for my brother, Doug Sr. Okay. This is first year around without Dawn. So those who have lost loved ones this year, Christmas, the holidays are hard times. I'm going to pray for them. You have a new building? Okay, so you're moving? The new part of it. Oh, the new part of it. Okay, so that's good. New room. Yay. Yeah. Okay, other prayers? Yeah. My wife, Joyce, she's uh, got the flu. She's got the flu? <laughs> oh my gosh, that poor woman. Okay, so mm -hmm. for Joyce. Ellie? Oh, yes, welcome prayers and prayers for Sharon, my sister. Okay, for your sister, for her health? She has a teeth cold. <coughs> she has a what? Has a teeth cold. Oh, yeah. And she worked on that. Okay. Yeah, that's hard. Uh, for Brian's dad, Jay, who's going to have that surgery this week, isn't he, Brian? Yeah. Yeah, so the carotid artery, rotor, rooter, whatever you guys call that. Um, yeah, Melissa. Um, <coughs> I'm going over my house with a dog, and I hope that he has a dog. <laughs> All I know is that one cat of yours is, could probably take the dog. It's that fat. I think there's a suit. I mean, it is like Garfield. It's huge. She is a chubby cat. Yeah. Go ahead, um, Jamie. You're going to see the doctor? 
Oh, you're going to the dentist for your teeth? Yep. Okay. My teeth came in. All right, your teeth came in. You're going to get your teeth. Perfect. <laughs> Sounds like me whenever I get my teeth out. So let's keep the teeth in. Okay. Um, and you guys are going to see the journey up at New Hope. Yep. So that's going on tonight. Um, and I think that next weekend, too. So that's from the creation all the way through Jesus' birth in Bethlehem. And you go outside, and there's like real camels and yep. Roman centurions that yell at you. And. Um, camels spit at you and it's fun so <laughs> check it out it's called the journey and i think if you just type in the journey it, um and then new hope traverse city acne whatever it'll come up yeah karen yeah yeah a lot of layoffs they're going to be cutting people so we want to pray for them that is it's no good time to lose your job but not really a good time to lose your job now. And I know I know Haggerty is nationwide too, so it might not all be from Traverse City, obviously, because they're nationwide, but um, Munson is. So and some will be Travers, yeah. Um, anything else? I'd just like to uh, pray that we have uh, decent weather and everybody enjoys themselves next weekend on that. And Santa's coming to town. We have a little bit of something to offer to everybody. So if you want to get in the holiday spirit, come on up and see us. Yeah, there's going to be um, sleigh rides. And it starts at 5. 5 o'clock on the 10th. Be up at the Rock. Santa's coming to town. Um, I was here two weeks ago and asked for uh, prayers. Uh, his name is Ed, Ed Bourne. Um, at first, he didn't want anything. Yeah. Um, they found the tumor is extremely aggressive, okay. and in four weeks it's doubled in size. Okay. And it's wrapped around one of the main arteries or vessels in his brain. Mm -hmm. So they don't want to try cutting it up. No, they're going to try to shrink it. Yeah. They're going to try. Okay. But it's an extremely very aggressive. Extremely aggressive. Okay. It grew doubled in size in four weeks. It's yeah, that's frightening. So for Ed Bourne. Ed Bourne. Okay, we want to pray for Ed for a brain tumor that is very aggressive. And so we want to pray that. And we know Jesus can do what Jesus wants to do. So we'll pray hard for Ed that that shrinks and they can figure out how to surgically remove it, or at least part of it. Anything else? All right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. And we thank you for reminding us that you are Lord of Lord and King of Kings. So we thank you that you being Lord and your Lordship go together. And so when we refuse to do what you say because it's uncomfortable or we're afraid we're going to look silly, or we have to understand that it's for our good to do what you tell us to do because that is how we get to experience an abundant life. That is how we get to show the world that you really are our Lord and that we choose to live for you. Help us to not think we can separate you being Lord and you asking and commanding us to do things and do it our way. No matter what the world says, Lord, we're going to do it your way. So thank you that you remind us it's going to be it's going to be work. It's going to be digging, learning more about you, and doing things that are countercultural to this world. But how else will they know that the baby in a manger is the Lord of all creation unless we show them? You've heard the prayers of your people. There are many for health situations. A lot of people dealing with cancer. Lord, it just seems to be running rampant. So we just pray for a cure. Something that maybe they've missed. Um, that you, Lord, can show them the direction to find it. And so we pray for those that will be having surgeries coming up. Tests coming up. More CAT scans coming up. We give you praise for those that have received good news, Lord. We thank you for that. Pray for complete healing for those with cancer. Lord, you've heard their names, and so we thank you for hearing those prayers. And we thank you, Lord, for teaching us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory.
glory forever. Amen. All right, so in the back, we have our grateful giving jar. Um, Brian, can you tell me what that sign says there? Do we know what it is? Christmas boxes. We're still going strong with the Christmas boxes. And they're going to be, we're going to be, um, that's also called Adopt a Child. So that's one and the same. So that's going to be happening here. And do you know how many families we're up to? Oh, we're up to 12. All right. So that's good. So um, we want to pray for those families. And thank you, church, for being so generous to those families that are in need. So let's pray for our offering now. Our God, architect of this world and all others, we know you had a vision for all your creation to dwell together. We ask you to help us use who we are and what we have to heal this abused and broken world. In Christ our Savior, amen. Please stand join us. We just did this, I think, last week, but just so we know the scripture. Cute, I know. 
so just, just so you know that Jill is amazing. She, we wouldn't be able to have half the stuff, three quarters, 99% of the stuff that we have being done. Um, the cohesiveness, she's the communications director, but she does so much more than that. She's the one who gets everything going on the website. She's the one who puts those slides up there. She, she does amazing stuff. I mean, I can't even tell you. And she helps me out so much. I could not do this without you. So please don't go anywhere. I won't. <laughs> I and uh, all of you guys, though, too. Yes. Thank you for being patient with me, too. Yay! So, hey, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Thank you so Thank you. much. All right. All right, Paul. Thank you. Some of you noticed that we did some remodeling downstairs yeah. uh, in the front entrance, put in the ceiling, and yeah. I just wanted to say thanks to everybody who was putting their Menards uh, rebate oh. certificates in the thing, because that whole project was funded through the rebates that we collected. Oh. Wow. Yeah. Thanks. We'll try it again next year when the when Menards relaunches that whole program, and so. And there's more remodeling to come because we bought products to get us by for a little while. So. All right, thank you. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you how you bless this church, and we thank you that we are known as the helping church in this community, and we thank you that we can go out and do what it means to follow your word, which is to feed and to help and to pray and to build relationships with others. That's what you command us to do, and, and to always remember that you are our Lord. You're in charge. So when you ask us to do something hard, Pray that we obey. In the name of Christ, amen. All right, head on down.